Hi everyone, welcome to the lecture on the vascular system, chapter 15. I like to think of our vascular system, also called our circulatory system, as our body's pipes and plumbing. These pipes are how we deliver the goods and then remove the waste throughout the body. All of these pipes, um, you can also call them blood vessels. And our body has three primary types of blood vessels that make up our vascular system. First, we have arteries, which carry the blood away from our heart, our deliverables. And then we have veins, which carry blood back to the heart, the receivables. And then third, we have capillaries. And capillaries are which connect the arteries and the veins at the tissue level. They are where all of this transition happens, kind of like the postal distribution centers. So again, arteries take, carry blood away from the heart to the tissues. Veins take the blood away from the tissues and bring it back to the heart. And those capillaries are the tiny little pipes that connect the arteries and veins and are typically embedded in all of the tissues in our body. The walls of arteries, of veins, and in capillaries are very different because of their intended purpose, but they all have layers to them. Some of them have three layers, just in different proportions, and some only have a couple of layers. So here are the three possible layers on this image here. The tunica intima is the innermost layer consisting of simple squamous epithelium, also known as your endothelium. So the tunica intima can also be called the endothelium. The endothelium is continuous with the same endothelium that lines our heart. It has a very smooth surface that provides friction-free flow of blood. And this layer also produces chemicals that cause the blood vessels to dilate or constrict. Nitric oxide is a big one of those chemicals. If this endothelium feels stretched, say from a surge of blood flow, that's when it will be stimulated to release those release nitric oxide and then stimulate the blood vessels to dilate. The tunica media is the middle layer. It is composed of smooth muscle and elastic tissue that allows the blood vessel to change in diameter. The smooth muscle is this layer in this layer is innervated by nerves of the autonomic nervous system. If we remember, sympathetic and parasympathetic impulses can change vasoconstriction or vasodilation. Here's where those nerve endings end up and then cause the tunica media to either relax or constrict. Tunica externa is the outer layer. It is made of strong, flexible, fibrous connective tissue that supports and protects the blood vessel. In veins, it is the thickest of the three la layers. In arteries, it is usually a little thinner than the middle layer. Let's just talk about the arteries for a second. Beginning at the heart, when the aorta leaves with fresh oxygenated blood and travels out to the large branches, such as the carotid arteries, they are known as what is called the conducting arteries. They expand quite a bit because the surge of blood coming from the heart is a huge amount of pressure. They also recoil back to their normal size when the ventricles of your heart relax. They're the most elastic. The conducting arteries divide into smaller arteries 
that then deliver blood to specific regions in the body. These are called distributing arteries. Examples of distributing arteries would be the brachial artery, the femoral, and the renal arteries. And finally, the distributing, distributing arteries branch into even smaller channels that go to very specific organs within their region. These are called arterioles. They are also considered resistance arteries because they are strong enough to regulate the pressure of blood coming from those bigger branches, as well as control the pressure needed to deliver the blood to the tissue. The velocity of the blood flow at this point in the distribution has to be appropriate for the delivery. Imagine if you were to water your delicate flowers with a high pressure spray nozzle. You would blow the petals right off the flower. So you have to control with the pressure to what is appropriate. And that is basically what the arterioles do. Veins, which return blood back to the heart, are mostly just categorized by size, starting very small at the tissue level and then converging to form larger and fewer vessels. They differ in their structure from ar arteries in that their walls are much thinner. Veins are not subjected to the immense pressure that the arteries are because they're so far away from the pump, which is your heart but they still carry high volumes of blood. But veins stretch quite a bit, which basically keeps the pressure relatively the same. Imagine your garden hose if it was able to stretch tons. The water coming out of the garden hose would then be moving slower, and that's what happens in the veins. Veins are sometimes called capacitance vessels because of this ability to stretch. Veins can also constrict extensively, which helps the body maintain blood pressure in the instance of a major blood volume drop. Here are the types of veins. Venules, the smallest veins, collect blood from capillaries. They have thin, porous walls that can exchange fluid with surrounding tissues. The venules converge to form medium-sized veins, really creative name, and these veins have thicker, more elastic walls that contain one-way valves to prevent backflow. Your radial and ulnar veins in your forearm are examples of medium-sized veins. Then eventually the medium sized veins converge to form large veins. These veins have a thick tunica externa, that outer layer, such as the vena cava or the pulmonary veins. And now you have capillaries. These are the microscopic tiny little vessels that link the tiny arterioles to the tiny venules. This is the place where nutrients from the blood horm and hormones are transferred from that blood to the tissue. And then wastes are transferred back from the tissue back into the blood. Capillaries are known as the exchange vessels because of this reason. Capillaries are more concentrated in certain areas in the body, and then they're less concentrated in others. For instance, tissue with a high metabolic rate, such as your liver, your kidneys, and your heart, contain a massive number of capillaries. Fibrous connective tissue, such as tendons, that have a lower metabolic rate, they contain way fewer capillaries. If you remember that certain tissues are more vascular than others, the capillary level is where this difference happens. There are even some tissues such as the epidermis, the cartilage, 
and the lens of your cornea of your eye, they don't have any capillaries at all. Those are the avascular tissues. The capillary wall consists of only an endothelium layer and then a basement membrane around it. They do not possess the tunica media or the tunica externa. They are tiny, thin little vessels, basically just wide enough for blood cells to pass through. Say blood is coming down the arterial pipeway and makes it to an arteriole right before it hits the target tissue or organ. The blood will then pass through what is known as a precapillary sphincter and then enter a whole network of capillaries that are webbed into that specific tissue or organ. This network or web is called a capillary bed. Some organs, such as the liver, the bone marrow, and the spleen, they contain unique capillaries called a sinusoid. These are even more permeable than regular capillaries to allow for the passage of large substances such as proteins and blood cells. This is how blood cells that are formed in the bone marrow actually enter the circulation of the blood. They are much bigger than the dissolved nutrients and gases, and therefore they need a special capillary to exchange through. Let's go back to the typical capillary bed now, not the sinusoid. So when you're exercising, your skeletal muscles are requiring a ton of blood. The precapillary sphincter will remain open to allow blood to continually fill and pass through the particular capillary bed. This provides the constant exchange of oxygen and nutrients and waste with that tissue fluid. When you are not exercising and just sitting and resting, the sphincter will close and only a trickle will bypass the capillary bed and flow directly from the arteriole to the venule and return back to the heart. What this illustrates is that the body does not contain enough blood to fill the entire vascular system all at once. It redistributes blood to areas in need depending on what your body is doing. For example, when you're exercising, less blood is going to your digestive system and your reproductive system and even your bones and brain and even more blood is going to your skeletal muscles and your heart because they're the ones that need it most at that time. Here's a diagram of how this works. I want you to find the black dotted line that goes through the middle of this figure. Below the black line represents the distribution of blood flow when you're at rest. And above the black line is the distribution of blood flow when you're exercising. Cardiac output when you're at rest is about five liters per minute. That means that your heart pumps five liters every minute when you're resting. An average cardiac output during heavy exercise though is increased to 25 liters per minute. But if you think about this, you only have five liters of blood total in your body. So that 25 liter, that increase to 25 liters is not an increase in blood volume. Basically what has to happen is all the blood then has to be redistributed if the need is greater in particular areas. So let's look at this figure and you can see all these organs represent different body systems. You're looking at the digestive organs, the liver, the stomach, and the intestines. When you're at rest, the distribution is about 20 to 25% of your blood. But then if you look up above the, the black line, the distribution during exercise decreases to three to 5%. So 
there's a significant redistribution of blood away from the digestive system to the other organs in need. Now let's look at the brain. At rest, your brain is receiving 15% of your blood. And then in exercise, it gets redistributed away from the brain and it drops to three to 4%. It's quite a bit of a difference. Now let's look at the muscle, the very end. At rest, your muscle is receiving 15 to 20% of blood. But at exercise, it's basically getting the majority of your blood there, 80 to 85%. So these capillary networks or these capillary beds and the way that they can close off or open up with sphincters, this is how your body redistributes that blood flow. Again, remember, you only have around five liters of blood in your body, and so you've got to pull from areas to give it to other areas if the need is greater than that. Let's just talk about how these capillaries exchange now. They exchange fluid and materials. Remember, back in the cells chapter, we talked about the different ways particles move across cell membranes. Those exchange methods were diffusion, filtration, and osmosis. Review these if you don't remember. This is basically where these three exchange methods apply. To begin, let's revisit what capillaries actually transfer in and out. First, they release gases such as oxygen to the tissues. They release nutrients such as glucose and fatty acids for energy. And they also release other chemicals such as hormones for cellular control. Second, your capillaries also take up waste, waste such as carbon dioxide from the tissues and ammonia and uric acid. Capillaries also transfer materials to be moved to other parts of the body, such as taking glucose from your intestines and then delivering it to the muscles, or taking calcium from your bones and delivering it to your heart. And of course, water. Water, which makes up the largest portion of our body, it moves in and out of cap capillaries all the time. Let's walk through a unit of blood flowing into a capillary bed, going through its exchange process, then leaving the, the bed and flowing back to the heart. The first step in capillary exchange involves diffusion. Diffusion is when particles, such as the gas oxygen, move from an area of greater concentration to an area of lesser concentration. Arterial blood full of oxygen enters the capillary bed with a high concentration. The concentration of oxygen is quite low in the tissues. As a result, the oxygen will diffuse out of the capillaries and into that surrounding fluid in the tissue. At the same time, the concentration of carbon dioxide, the waste product, is high in the tissues but low in the capillaries. The same thing happens as the CO2 will diffuse across the capillary wall from the tissues down to the vessels. This is obviously the most important step as oxygen delivery is crucial to tissue survival. Remember, diffusion is particles moving from high concentration to low concentration. And this is how gases are exchanged from capillaries to the tissues. Also occurring as the blood enters the capillary bed from the arterial side is the process of filtration. Filtration is when dissolved particles, 
move across the membrane as a result of pressure, not concentration. The particles will move from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. As shown in the figure on the left, the pressure in the artery end of the capillary bed is about 30 to 35 millimeters of mercury. The pressure in the surrounding tissue fluid is about two millimeters of mercury. Now you can see where the difference occurs. The figure on the right demonstrates how the high pressure in the capillaries push plasma and its dissolved nutrients, such as glucose and amino acids, through the capillary wall and into the surrounding tissue. Gas exchange happens as a result of diffusion, and nutrient and plasma exchange happens as a result of filtration. And remember, plasma is primarily water. Now the blood continues to move through the capillary bed toward the venous end. Because all of this filtration happening earlier, the pressure inside the capillaries has dropped to about 10 millimeters of mercury. This is illustrated in the figure on the left. Albumin, the main protein in plasma, however, is still present in the capillaries. But the plasma fluid, which is primarily water, has mostly filtered out to the tissue. So the capillaries toward the venous end will go through osmosis. Remember, osmosis is the movement of fluid, not solid particles, across the membrane from an area of high concentration to low concentration. Due to filtration earlier, the tissues are now in a high concentration of fluid, hence why the pressure has increased in the tissue and dropped in the vessels. Osmosis will now happen where the fluid will move from high, which is in the tissues, to low, which is in the capillaries, and it will pull all the waste products such as ammonia and uric acid with it. So, the gases exchange via diffusion, the nutrients and plasma exchange via filtration, and then all the water, fluid, and waste exchange via osmosis. So this is happening in the capillary beds all the time. Let's switch gears and talk about the pulmonary circulation. Our body has two main pathways of circulation, with the heart being like a connector of those two pathways. One is this pulmonary circulation, which is where blood travels to and from the lungs for gas exchange. And then the other is the systemic circulation, which delivers the goods to the rest of the body and removes the waste from the rest of the body. The lungs need a blood supply as well, which actually doesn't happen through the pulmonary circulation. The lung tissue actually gets its blood supply through the systemic circulation. Other specialized circulations exist, such as the coronary, which is your heart, and brain circulation, but the pulmonary and the systemic are the two largest pathways or routes. We will walk through every vessel in the systemic circulation, but let's first go over the route for the pulmonary circulation. Step one, blood leaves the right ventricle through the pulmonary trunk, which then branches into a right and left pulmonary artery. You'll see in the slide that number one, or all of this blood leaving the heart at number one is blue. That's representing the fact that it's deoxygenated. But remember, arteries are what the type of vessel is that leaves the heart. 
And so even if it's blue, it's still called an artery because it's leaving the heart. So these pulmonary arteries now enter the lungs, step two. Step three, the pulmonary artery branches into smaller arteries, one for each lobe of the lung. These arteries then branch into smaller and smaller arteries until they end at the capillary beds in the tissue of the lungs. Step four, the capillaries surround the alveoli where the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide occur. We'll talk more about that structure in the respiratory system. And then step five, these capillaries form venules which merge to form veins. And then the veins merge until forming the final pulmonary vein, which then returns the oxygenated blood to the left atrium of the heart. Pulses. Your pulse is the surge of pressure that can be felt in your arteries from each beat of your heart. There are several places where these arteries come close to the surface of the skin and you can actually feel your pulse. The most common places to feel it are the carotid artery and the radial artery. FYI, when you're using your hand to feel your pulse, you don't ever want to use your thumb as the feeler. The reason why is the radial artery is a good location to feel your pulse which is basically the artery that goes to your thumb. And this will sometimes have a pulse of its own and it'll interfere with what you're actually feeling in say your wrist or your carotid artery on your neck. So to avoid confusion, use your pointer and middle fingers to feel your pulse. See if you can find your carotid pulse and see if you can find your radial pulse. There are a lot of other places that your pulse can be felt, but it's a bit harder. If you were just post-exercise and your heart rate was really high, perhaps you'd be able to feel your pulse in those other locations a lot better. Let's take a step back and look at the big picture of circulation. The whole reason blood flow flows is because of these differences in pressure between two structures. Blood moves from a higher pressure gradient to a lower pressure gradient, just like a garden hose. Right as blood leaves the heart, it's at its greatest pressure. And this is illustrated on the left side of this table. As blood moves away from the heart, pressure begins to decline. You can see this drop as it goes from large arteries to small arteries to arterioles. Then eventually when it hits the capillaries, it is at a really low pressure. And then the small veins and eventually large veins that are leading back to heart also have even less pressure. And the reason why is because those veins are very stretchy and therefore they allow the pressure to decrease because they can expand to allow the blood flow through. A few things affect this pressure gradient and having proper blood pressure at all points in our circulation is crucial for proper delivery of materials to the tissues. Cardiac output blood volume, and the resistance that blood meets along the way all affect blood pressure. Let's take cardiac output. Cardiac output is the volume of blood that your heart can pump out in one minute. When the heart beats faster, meaning there's more beats per minute, such as during exercise, cardiac output increases. This will also increase blood pressure. When cardiac output falls, such as when exercise ends, or say the heart is diseased and weak, blood pressure will fall. 
Now let's look at blood volume. When blood volume declines, such as from dehydration, because water makes up such a large portion of our blood, or say from a large hemorrhage, like from an accident where blood loss is great, blood pressure will also fall. In the case of dehydration, the body will try to preserve blood pressure. There is a thing that's called essential hypertension. And this is basically how much blood pressure is necessary to keep the flow of blood going. So in the case of dehydration, when your body's trying to preserve blood pressure, it will cause your kidneys to reduce your urine output. And this keeps all the fluid in your blood rather than peeing it out. Therefore, boosting blood volume. You guys have probably experienced this. If you've been de dehydrated, you don't pee as much. Now, resistance is basically anything that creates opposition to flow, such as friction along the way of our vessels or even the narrowing of our vessels. This is also called peripheral resistance. Same thing. The lower the resistance, the faster the flow, and therefore the lower the pressure. The more resistance, the slower the flow, and therefore greater pressure. Friction and narrowing of our vessels inside is the most often caused by plaque buildup or a stiffening of the vessel's walls, which, allow, which prevents them from being able to stretch. The buildup of plaque on the inside of the vessels, narrowing the vessels, this is a disease called atherosclerosis. So you can measure this pressure using a blood pressure cuff. When your ventricles contract, also known as systole, this is when there is the most pressure in the arteries. When you measure this, it's called your systolic blood, blood pressure. When your ventricles relax, also known as diastole, this is when there's the least pressure in the arteries. And this measurement is the diastolic blood pressure. The reading you get is your systolic over your diastolic, such as a blood pressure of 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. A blood pressure less than 120 over 80 is considered healthy when you're at rest. A blood pressure between 120 and 139 systolic and 80 to 89 diastolic is considered prehypertensive. And greater than 140 over 90 is considered hypertensive, basically high blood pressure. And this is the point when doctors will consider medical intervention. The peripheral resistance piece to this blood pressure equation plays a huge role. This resistance, like I said before, it can be caused by the vessel diameter being too narrow or friction along the way. But also resistance can be caused by blood being too thick, like molasses. This means it's got greater viscosity. Viscosity is more acute meaning it happens situationally, not all the time, such as in the case of when we're dehydrated. The vessel diameter is the chief way of controlling peripheral resistance. It's more chronic. In healthy blood vessels, the ability to constrict and then dilate are quite vast. The endothelium and the tunica media, they can narrow down the lumen, which is the tunnel in the middle of the vessel, and it can increase blood pressure if needed. This is called vasoconstriction. The endothelium and the tunica media can also widen that lumen and increase blood flow and therefore decrease the pressure. 
This is vasodilation. The elastic property of healthy arteries allows them to expand with each beat of the heart and to absorb some of the force of that ejected blood. When the heart is in diastole, the arteries recoil to prevent blood pressure from dropping to zero. This expansion and recoil helps propel blood downstream towards the capillaries. And it also helps smooth out the surges of pressure that occur with systole, protecting those smaller arteries at the end of the pathway. This dilation and constriction is happening constantly in our conducting arteries, the ones that leave the heart, as well as in the distributing arteries due to each heartbeat. It dilates when the heart is in systole and contracting and squeezing blood out. And then it, the vaso, then it vasoconstricts when the heart is in diastole and it rests where it's not squeezing blood out. So away from blood pressure, now let's talk about blood velocity. The velocity or the speed at which blood travels, it differs like the pressure does throughout the body circulation. Flow is the fastest coming right out of the aorta and slows considerably by the time it reaches those capillaries. Friction along the way, the vessels becoming smaller, as well as the number of branches becoming greater, all play a part in this slowing of the velocity. This slow rate at the capillaries gives them time to do all of that exchanging that needs to happen, that diffusion, filtration, and osmosis. Velocity will actually speed up again after it leaves the capillary beds, as blood flows from smaller veins into larger veins into the largest veins. The amount of surface area that blood passes by decreases as the veins merge and then become larger and larger. This provides less peripheral resistance and therefore the flow speeds up a bit in those bigger veins. Blood pressure can actually quickly change in response to a body's changing needs. This occurs via input from our nervous system, as well as our endocrine system. Here's how the neural regulation works. Baroreceptors that are located in your carotid arteries in the aorta, they detect changes in blood pressure, and then they transmit signals along the cranial afferent nerve to the cardiac control center and the vasomotor center that are located in the medulla of your brain. Remember all this from your nervous system chapter. Then, if the sensation of that pressure was too high from the baroreceptors, the medulla increases its output of parasympathetic impulses, the rest and digest impulses. This causes vasodilation of the arteries that are leaving the heart and it also causes a slowing in the heart rate. This decreases cardiac output, and if you remember from earlier slide, that also drops blood pressure. Now, if those baroreceptors sense that the pressure was too low, the medulla in the brain increases its output of sympathetic impulses. Vasoconstriction will then occur in the arteries leaving the heart, and then the heart rate will also speed up, and this will bring pr blood pressure back up. Now let's talk about the hormonal regulation of blood pressure. Organs like your liver, your adrenal glands, your kidneys, and even the atria of your heart are also involved in regulating blood pressure because they secrete hormones that affect blood volume and then also vessel diameter. Let's start with the hormones that raise blood pressure. 
renin, angiotensin 1, and angiotensin 2, they cause vasoconstriction and water retention. Vessel diameter decreases and blood volume increases, which then raises blood pressure. The next hormone, aldosterone. Aldosterone is secreted by the adrenal glands when your blood pressure falls suddenly. Aldosterone will stimulate your kidneys to retain sodium. And remember, water always follows sodium. So then that will increase the blood volume by water moving into the blood and not through your pee. If blood volume increases, blood pressure increases. Next, you have antidiuretic hormone or ADH. Remember from your nervous system chapter, ADH is secreted by the posterior pituitary gland. And this happens when water content of your body falls, such as in dehydration. ADH promotes vasoconstriction and water retention as well at the kidneys. And again, vessel diameter decreasing and blood volume increasing, that causes blood pressure to raise back up. And last, you have epinephrine and norepinephrine. These are secreted by the adrenal medulla when the body is under stress. And these hormones cause an increase in heart rate and force of contraction, as well as vasoconstriction to withstand that force of the blood coming out of the heart. And this increases blood pressure. Now the last one is the only one that lowers blood pressure. Atrial natriuretic peptide, or ANP. This is released by the heart's atria when elevated blood pressure stretches the walls of the heart. ANP causes vasodilation, which increases vessel diameter. It also stimulates the kidneys to excrete sodium into your pee. Water always follows sodium, and therefore you pee out a lot of water, and this reduces blood volume. This is how ANP decreases blood pressure. All right, veins. Now veins, they have a little bit different mechanism to get blood through the vessels rather than the heart pumping through the arteries. Yes, pressure plays a part, but the pressure is quite low if you remember from an earlier slide. Also, Gravity tends to fight the blood moving from our lower extremities back to our heart. One-way valves periodically placed along the veins prevents backflow of the blood, and this keeps, keeps it flowing in the correct direction. But two mechanisms actually work to pump that blood through the veins. One, is the contraction of our skeletal muscles. The muscles squeeze the veins, pushing that blood through the one-way valves and propel it towards the heart. When the muscles relax, the force of gravity causes the remaining blood to pull in the valve flaps. Luckily, they are closed, but this is why a deep vein thrombosis is so common in sedentary and bedridden individuals. The blood just pools. When the muscles of the lower extremities are never used, then nothing is pushing that blood through the valves and the veins. The second mechanism is the respiratory pump. When we inhale, everyone do this, your chest expands and the diaphragm muscle moves downward, increasing the thoracic cavity volume. This actually causes the pressure in that chest cavity to drop because we're expanding the space. And then the pressure in the abdominal cavity below the diaphragm increases because that space is being compressed. The rising abdominal pressure 
squeeze is on the inferior vena cava, the large vein that drains our lower body, forcing that blood upward towards that lower pressure in the chest cavity. This lower pressure in the chest cavity draws that blood up towards the heart. But once the lungs reach their air capacity, the pressure in the chest cavity goes back up. We have to exhale, then inhale again to activate this respiratory pump of drawing that blood back up. So the heart pumping and pressure gradients move the blood through our arterial network and one-way valves, muscular contraction, and the respiratory pump move the blood through our venous network. The next few slides are um, gonna walk through basically naming and identifying the principal arteries and veins, as well as some of the specialty circulatory systems that we have in our body. You're gonna use this information for your assignment that goes along with chapter 13 and this one, chapter 15. So let's walk through this systemic circulation. All of the systemic arteries begin at the aorta. The aorta originates in the left ventricle of your heart, then it divides into three regions. The ascending aorta is the first region, only a few centimeters above the left ventricle. And also the right and the left coronary arteries, the ones that supply the heart, they branch from this ascending artery, I'm sorry, aorta. The aortic arch is the second region. This part curves over the top of the heart and then turns downward behind the heart, making an inverted U. The aortic arch branches again into three major arteries. The brachiocephalic, which delivers blood to the right side of the head and the right arm. It also branches into the left carotid artery, which delivers to the left side of the head, and the left subclavian artery, which delivers to the left arm. Because your heart doesn't sit symmetrically in your chest, the branches that go towards the right side of your body are a bit different than the left branches. The final and third region of the aorta is the descending aorta. This region travels downward behind the heart through the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavities. Its subregions are called the thoracic aorta, which is above the diaphragm, and the abdominal aorta, which is below the diaphragm. The abdominal aorta ends in your lower abdomen, kind of around your belly button, and eventually branches into a right and left iliac arteries, which supply blood to the lower pelvis and down your legs. We're gonna walk through these principal arteries on this slide. Um, and remember that often there are right and left branches of your body of the same artery. So starting at the top, you've got your subclavian artery, I mentioned that earlier. The clavian artery goes basically along your collarbone on the right and the left side. Then this artery, the next region, eventually becomes the axillary artery, which is right around your armpit. Then the brachial artery, which travels down your upper arm or along the humerus. This is the artery that is um, occluded during the typical blood pressure measurement. And the brachial artery will branch into the radial artery and the ulnar artery. And the ulnar goes along the ulna, the radial goes on along the radius. And the radial artery is the one that goes down towards your thumb, and that's where you can feel your pulse in your wrist. Now going down the leg, <clears throat> actually let's stick with the trunk of the body. The thoracic aorta, we talked about what region of the aorta that is. And then branching off of the abdominal aorta, you have what's called the celiac trunk artery. 
This branches eventually towards the stomach and the liver and the spleen. The renal arteries also leave from the abdominal aorta and go towards your kidneys. The superior mesenteric artery goes towards your small intestines and the inferior mesenteric artery goes towards your large intestines. The common iliac artery is basically the iliac artery. And you have one on the left and one on the right. And this common iliac artery branches into an internal and an external iliac artery that go more towards the superficial side of your thigh and then the internal part of your thigh. Also branching off the iliac artery is the femoral artery. This is the big artery that runs along the femur. And then behind your kneecap, you have the popliteal artery. And this popliteal artery will then branch into an anterior tibial and a posterior tibial, essentially running in front of the tibia and behind the tibia. And at the very end, you have the dorsal pedis artery that then branches into smaller arteries down towards your feet. Let's take a closer look at the arteries in the head and the neck region. Starting with the right and left carotid arteries, they're about the location of your Adam's apple, you'll see that they branch into an external and an internal artery, which then enters your cranial cavity. Know that the right carotid artery arises from the brachiocephalic artery, and the left carotid artery arises from the aortic arch. Traveling further out to the right and the left subclavian arteries, another head artery, the vertebral artery, arises and extends up the back of the neck. And this artery travels through the cervical vertebrae and also supplies the head with blood. You have a right and a left vertebral artery as well. If you were to take a brain and lie it on the table in front of you, with the top of the brain touching the table, you would be able to see the undersurface. This is where the circle of Willis is located, a specialty circulation for the brain. The two vertebral arteries unite here, and they form what is called the basilar artery. The carotid arteries also travel into this area, and form several anastomoses to create the circle of Willis. An anastomosis is basically a shortcut. The purpose of this circle is to provide multiple pathways for blood to reach the brain. This system of redundancy makes sure that the brain has several backup plans for blood. Along this circle, two posterior communicating arteries keep the circle going, and then two posterior cerebral arteries deliver blood to specific areas in the brain. Next, you'll see where the carotids enter the circle. After the carotids enter the circle, two anterior cerebral arteries also deliver blood to specific regions of the brain. The circle finally comes to a close with a bridge known as the anterior communicating artery. This circle ensures that the brain will always receive an adequate supply of blood. Basically, the communicating arteries keep the circle going, and then the other ones leave the circle to go deliver to specific regions. You can think of the circle of Willis as kind of like a roundabout that you drive through. There are many ways in and out. If one of those ways in and out were blocked, the circle could still keep going as to not block the other ways in and out. I'm going to walk through a few of the principal veins now. Remember, veins are what take blood away from the tissues and deliver it back to the heart. So you have these jugular veins, internal and external. There's one, some on the right, some on the left. 
and they basically drain all of the blood that comes from the brain and your face. These then dump into the subclavian veins. Just like the arteries, they're similar names in similar locations. And you have a brachiocephalic vein that, del that delivers blood coming from that right side of the body. Superior vena cava is the main trunk that enters the top of the left right atrium of the heart. And then the inferior vena cava is the trunk that enters also in the right atria of the heart, but delivers all the blood from the bottom of your body. Axillary vein is around the armpit. Cephalic vein is out towards your shoulder. And the median cubital vein, kind of in the pit of your elbow, this is if you gave blood, this is the vein that they tap in order to draw blood. The hepatic vein drains the liver, and because of its proximity to the heart, a right-sided heart failure can cause congestion in the liver. Down towards the lower part of the body, you have your iliac veins, an internal and an external and a common, that then merge into that inferior vena cava. You also have a femoral vein, same location as the femoral artery. And you have this vein that runs all the way from your hips down to your feet called the great saphenous vein. This one is the longest vein in the body. Again, you have the popliteal vein that runs right behind the knee. Last, we're gonna talk about the hepatic portal circulation. One of our specialty circulatory pathways is this. The purpose of this microsystem is for venous blood coming from our gut organs, such as our intestines, our spleen, and our stomach, to drain all of the blood through the liver last for a final clean out before that blood is returned to the inferior vena cava and back to the heart. Here's the pathway. Blood from capillaries of the intestines flow into the inferior and the superior mesenteric veins. Venous blood from the spleen flows into the splenic vein. The inferior and superior mesenteric veins merge to form what's called the portal vein. And here is where it picks up blood from that stomach, the pancreas, and the gallbladder. This portal vein is the final stop for all of these gut organs before it enters the liver. Then the portal vein empties all the blood into the liver. The liver removes any excess glucose, toxins, bacteria, and cleans it out and leaves the liver through the hepatic vein. The hepatic vein then drains into the inferior vena cava, which then travels up to the right atria of your heart. That concludes the lecture for the vascular system, chapter 15. Use these slides, use your book, and also use complete anatomy to explore where all of these principal arteries and principal veins are located. Know where the regions are and to be able to identify them by name.